So I want to introduce your first speaker for tonight. And Paul has been with us with Q2 for the last, I think, eight days now, um, working with our team. Um, and he'll explain a little bit more about what he's been doing with us in his presentation and, and talking topics afterwards. So Dr. Paul Englert. Now you'll notice that his name is E-N-G-L-E-R-T. It's not Englert. It's, as he told us when we first met him, think Piglet, and then it's Englert. That's how you say his surname. <laughs> as you can see here, what his job is. But he is a fascinating young man. I say young man because he's younger than me, but he's actually not that young. He's a licensed psychologist, he'll tell you that himself, with a PhD in industrial organizational psychology. Um, an amazing depth of knowledge, understanding, and deep thinking into the human nature. And when we talk about the globalization and the internet world, he's actually a New Zealander, and he's living and working in Singapore. <laughs> so that's where the world is going. So he, he feels, and he believes, and I quote, that good applied science is the key to unleashing success globally. He's also an avid sportsman. We know that his one priority of coming to Manila was that he had to have a hotel with a good gym. He also loves judo. But, and they are his unwinding tools of choice. But this weekend we took him to Porto Galera and he's got a newfound love of El Galleon and Asia divers and diving in the Philippines. So I'm sure he'll be back. He also has... Um, an interesting views on globalization and culture, and is an avid people watcher, I've had experience of this, and listener amongst the generation, the younger generation. So I want you to put your hands together to give Dr. Paul a warm welcome to the podium to talk further about understanding younger professionals. Oh, thanks everyone. Uh, it's, it is a pleasure to be here. I won't use this. The, uh, can everyone hear me? I've got a yeah, good. It's, I think if I stand there, it's a little, uh, it's a little hard for me. Yeah. So uh, no, I'm all right. Thank you. Uh, it's not it is. It's a real pleasure to be here. And in terms of the way that we want to do this talk, it's ten minutes of thought-provoking stuff. The real discussion will come, and the real learning will come from the discussion. But I want to set the scene to get us thinking about it. And I want to get us thinking about it in a way that's slightly different uh, than what you may have seen around this topic previously. I think a lot of the stuff that's talked about in this space is, I won't say lightweight, but plays at the surface. And I think we need to think about this a lot deeper. So I want to take us back a little bit of, to, the, uh, to the 60s Oops. and bring us to this generation. This is the generation who are now our leaders. These are the ones who are saying, hold on, what are the young doing? You know, how can we manage them? I think we've got Madoff here. I think we've got, you know, take your pick. Point being that in this point in time, what they are dreaming about where their head is at, what they are projecting, is around meaning, meaning in life. And I'm going to use that as a theme as we start to talk about Gen Y in the workplace, and just young people generally in the workplace. The whole driver for this was that there was, we needed change. We needed change. They'd grown up in a world which they didn't agree with, <coughs> and they wanted change. Now, their focus wasn't work. Their context wasn't work. It was, it was broader than that. It was about a complete change in the way that, that we do things. And through that came a lot of great change. You know, th this is the birth of feminism. You know, this is the birth of the peace movement in a big way. This is a lot of positives that come from broadening our mind and thinking about the change that youth movements bring. That youth movements bring. Think of the music that we got from this period. That comes from that free thinking. That comes from that ability to accept change. Moving on, on to Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. 
this is another phenomenon that I want to use as a, not so much a metaphor, but something to put a context around our thinking around this change. Here we have a, a very uncompromising guy. I think we've all heard the stories now of, of Steve Jobs and the way that he approached life and the way that he did things. But if you look at the gift that the likes of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs have given the rest of us, whose life is not currently touched by these people? Now this comes from thinking different. This comes from not accepting the status quo. This comes from believing that you can do things different. It also comes from being born in a certain period in time. And I think that's another point that I want to drop into the ocean of this conversation, which is the time that you're born in gives you a different perspective. We always draw upon that time when we're born. And if you're around when the start of all of this technology is there, and you can see a different way that it could come together, you're naturally going to grab it. And if other people can't see it, maybe that they are closed in their mind, a little bit older, whatever it might be, it's not going to stop you going down that track. So I want, I want to leave those two thoughts for the moment, but I want to uh, use that as, as, a, as a groundwork for where we're going with this conversation about Gen Y in the workplace. I don't want it to be a superficial conversation. We've got 10 minutes just to set the scene, and then throw it over to you guys. Moving on to the current period, Egypt. What happened in Egypt, and what is happening in the Middle East, is truly remarkable. What is happening around the world is truly remarkable. You're talking about cultures that have been running a certain way for a very, very long period of time. Now, the types of change that we're seeing, the types of change that's been driven by young people who are saying, nah, I've had enough, and we can get this message out there now. Look at all those people with cell phones, <coughs> taking pictures, twittering them out, getting them onto Facebook. You know, the message is there, and people who were in power no longer have that power. And you're seeing a younger generation, that's how they see the world. And that brings us to work. That brings us to the world of work. Now, I'm not one of those people that believe every workplace should look like this. You know? I think that's, I think that's somewhat artificial. Um... That, that, that is the, that, that's the world of work. My, my doctorate was actually in youth unemployment, so it wasn't, in, it wasn't actually in making workplaces like this. But there is a lot of similarities between this, that first image, that second image, that third image. And I want to draw on those similarities to bring this all around uh, with respect to thinking about young people at work. If we have a look at that picture, when we have a look at that working environment, we think back to that first uh, image. That first image was all around meaning, creating meaning in one's life. What is life about? That divide between work and meaning is no longer there. One of the big things that Gen Y have really brought to the table is that work and life should blend. And I want my Facebook, I want my work, I want my triple screens, because I don't want to have this great divide anymore. And I want meaning in my work. And so I, I don't really want that. I really, really need that. I also want to have access to technology. You know, I want to be able to enjoy the change that's going. Rather than being afraid of change, I'm embracing it. You know, I need it all the time. I need it all the time. And the other point is that I won't respect someone just because they're in power. I won't respect someone just because they've got authority. 
Now that's often very hard. I'm 42 years old. Well, 41, I'll be 42 soon. You know? but I'm, I'm, I'm an X generation, and I'll talk about the, the, the difference between some of these generations, and they're all very global cliches. You know, I, I sometimes worry about us using cliches and talking about generations as, as if they are all these one group, because they aren't one group. You know, and, and different regions think about these things differently. Different people think about these things differently. So we use this as just a, a framework to help our understanding. So in terms of this 10-minute conversation, this taste test on some of these things, I want to talk a little bit about these generational differences, using the sorts of concepts that we've talked about. And then I want to talk about managing Gen Y, and managing people who think in this way. And then finally I want to talk about the ageing workforce. Because I don't think you can talk about what's happening with respect to the changing nature of work without talking about the ageing workforce. That has major implications for society. It has major implications for the talent that we're trying to bring through. And we need to put that on the table as well. So these are, some, these are some general themes that are talked about when we talk about some of these uh, generational differences. And again, I don't think that you can really understand this topic when you're thinking just about the world of work. And that's part of the problem, is that too many people have been approaching this topic as if it's just about work. You know, so we hear the downside of what Gen Y want but we're not understanding that in the context of life. And that's why uh, I enjoyed Sarah's introduction, because it put things in a context. So if you have a look at, and some of these I agree with, some of them I don't, but I realise that it's important to give not my take, but the, the general take. So, has this got a pointer? There we go. Okay, so if we look at, and I like to think of it too in, for music terms, if you look at the baby boomers, a lot of what was driving that was optimism. Optimism of what the world could be, you know, belief in, in what it could be. My generation, the the Gen X, you know, we we grew up, our <coughs> big, uh, the people who often define Gen X, the ones who they talk about defining it as Nirvana. So if you look at music like Nirvana or Smashing Pumpkins, and music is great to get an understanding of this whole generational thing. So for those that are that, that this is a very new topic, listen to the music of those periods. Because they tell you a lot about how that how they're thinking. So Gen X, uh, far more skeptical. Gen Y, there's this realism about, hey, this is how the world's working. This is how it really goes. And I'm going to make it work for me. And that's a very different take. Um, I, I think that we all know this sort of dealing with money, one, and the way that these generations think about money, the way they think about investing, they think about saving. You know, there's some, there's some differences there. And if you look at how the world's economies have gone, you can see why there's those differences. The way that I view it in terms of being a saver, and that was the whole thing with Gen X, was they used to say, well, you know, this was a generation who you couldn't advertise to. A lot of these terms come from marketing. You couldn't advertise to them because they wouldn't spend. It's very different to Gen Y, who are earning to spend. You know, and again, there's all this negativity about Gen Y. But Gen Y are the ones that drive a lot of the economy because they earn it, they spend it, they earn it, they spend it. Okay, so what is work? What is work? And we're going to get to that whole work thing very shortly. But, you know, for, for the baby boomers, it was an, an exciting adventure. It was something to start. I could start a business. I could start a company. The world was my oyster. You know, I could do a lot of these things. Gen X, you've got a lot of that cynicism. Perhaps not. You know, it's going to be a struggle. This is just a... This is a contract. It's a contract between me and an employer. That's what I'm getting into. Gen Y was far that the again. It's this idea that it's more about my own personal fulfilment, and then that drives a whole lot of other things. 
it drives this idea that respect must be earned. I think that's a really hard one for people of my generation and for people older than me to necessarily grab. To have somebody younger who's not going to just say, well, you've earned your place there. It's that unless I see it, unless I see you as somebody who is able to contribute, unless I see you as somebody who is uh, of standing, I'm really not going to give you that credibility just because you've got that title. Very different way of seeing it. I think this is the one that we all know about, which is these attitudes towards loyalty with that employer. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about, well, okay, how do we how do we manage that? But that, that idea of a job for life that, you know, I certainly didn't grow up with, and I don't know who in this room who did, but I was I was around in the 90s when a lot of these changes were happening in New Zealand at the time when I grew up in the, in the 80s. I came from a politi very politically aware family, and I saw that change where people who thought they had a job for life, suddenly they lost that job for life. So I'm in that X generation seeing it very skeptically. The Y generation aren't even thinking about it. You know, it doesn't even register the concept of it as an anathema. What what does being successful? What does being successful mean? Again, this is going to vary across across generations. You know, and if we if we have a look at this idea of success, this idea of learning new things, continual growth, having a complete, rich, full life. You know, they're things that we we all cherish. But I think, and I and if I think back to my own cohort and, and groups, I think we did put a lot of stuff on hold during those different periods. Gen Y is not one of those groups which is wanting to put a lot of those things on hold. And that is a big part of this whole uh, intergenerational discussion. Feedback is another one. The way that we process feedback. The way that different groups want to be fed. You know, the idea of assuming you're always going to get feedback when you want it is very unique to this generation. I, I remember uh, I had a, a role uh, in Australia, and uh, it was a fairly high-powered role, I suppose, and I was answerable to a board, and I'd been doing it for uh, probably about five months, and I uh, hadn't really had any feedback. And I took one of the board members aside one day and I said, look, you know, it's going well, enjoying it, things are great, but um, uh, yeah, just some feedback, you know, what's, what's going on? And he said, uh, you still here? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> said, do you need any more? <laughs> you know, and, that, and for me that was fine. It's sort of like, was, yeah, fair cop guff, you know, and, and told me, I can't get away with that managing my stuff. You know, most of the people that I have to manage are uh, in their 20s, 30, constant feedback, constant appraisal. And, and, and that's something that uh, is a very defining characteristic. The way that they want to interact is, is very different as well. And I think that whole desire to participate is very, very uh, defining characteristic. And we'll talk about that, well, I'll drop that seed in the three and a half minutes I've got left, to uh, around participation, uh, because that's a big key to managing and working with this current generation. So, so how do we take these lessons, how do we build upon that and get the best out of that generation, or get that best out of that generation? And, a key is to, is to listen, and listening is not just hearing, but listening is trying to open up to what can I gain from <coughs> this conversation. And you get that by being open to what's being said. And that means that the way that we've always done things is not necessarily the way that we will always do things. And 
to do that, you need to allow people to have some freedom. Uh, but we, as we're going to see, it can't be too much freedom. And I think that's where organisations have gone a little bit off the rails sometimes, is that they allow too participatory uh, working environment. You still need to have those boundaries. You still need to have that structure. You've got to encourage the can-do attitude in the sense that you've got to look what you can gain from it. You've got a generation coming through that are far more technologically savvy, are far more aware of what's going on than often the people who are leading them. So it's about real leadership. Not management, but real leadership. Which means how can I encourage that can-do attitude but still have some boundaries? Learning, and if we come back to the whole meaning and work, learning and challenge and growth are vital. If you want to keep your young people for longer than the two, the three, the four years, look at how you're going to get them to grow. That is absolutely vital. You know, if, if there's one take-home point, it's around that growth. And you can do this. If you define when you're going to put in certain training rewards, you know, if you've got training programs that you can put them into, and don't just think about training related to your organisation. Recognise that your organisation may be the stepping stone to something else. And there's nothing wrong with training them for that something else. Which is a little bit left field, but it means that you can keep them for a much longer period of time. So look at what could they train for in two years' time that's going to allow them to move to something. And it could be completely unrelated to what you're doing. But it's a fair trade because you'll keep them for that period. And it's that longevity where you're going to get your, your real returns. So that last point about, about training, and we'll talk about this, and I know this, this is a little rush, but I've got 10 minutes to get through it, um, and there's a little video I want to show, it's just to also help with the discussion, because the talk is part of it, but the real goal will come from that discussion. Having said all of that, it's important to still provide structure. It's still very important to be very clear on how this contract's going to go. It doesn't mean giving up everything, and I think that's part of the dilemma for managers and leaders, is that they sometimes swing too far one way or swing too far the other way. It's understanding what are my boundaries and making very clear what those boundaries are and how that contract's going to work. So if I know that in two years' time I'm going to give you all of this training, I'm going to give you all of the stuff, you're going to get to choose what that's going to be. I'm going to help negotiate you into this next role. I'm going to use my contacts to get you into this organisation or that organisation. This is what I want from you. And this is how we're going to this is how we're going to work it. How do you feel about it? Let's let's get this out on the table. Let's have that discussion now so that we're clear on where this whole thing is going. That second point is a real big one for General Line, and there's no getting around it. If you are not a good leader, learn to be a good leader. If you do an honest, personal appraisal and you recognise that, yeah, actually, the way that I lead is purely dictatorial, is purely directive, and that's how I want it, well, you'll get a group of people accordingly. You know, if you aren't up to your game as a leader, then likewise, you've got to raise the standard because there's no getting away from that anymore. You're not able to just rely on a title. And consider that everyone's different. I think one thing that Gen Y really hate, and just as we all hate, is being categorised as a box. So every individual is very different. So it's very much about understanding that individual, where they're coming from, and where they're coming from as a person. So it's, uh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be the three key points that I want to, to leave you with. I know that I'm nearly over time. So it's, it's about that balance. It's about that balance. It's about the balance of having that meaning as well as providing that structure.
And if you can give them the vision, if you can give them the vision of where you're going to help them move to, together with that structure, then you've got a chance of really making this work. Now I want to get on in the last little bit just to this ageing workforce. This is the world currently. The blue bits here are uh, the parts of the world where we've got you know, quite a young workforce. But if you look at the red bits, this is where we're looking at about 20% of the population, 20% of the working age population. This, this is, and for the working age we're using a figure of 60. Uh, where you've got about 20, 25% of the world that is uh, 60 or above. In 2050, these are the figures here, 35 to 40 percent. This is the this is what the world's going to look like in terms of aging <coughs> workforce. There are so many countries now that are pushing this whole have babies, and uh, it's not working. It's not working. The whole replacement rate. Uh, is going to be coming from these areas here, not these areas here. And if we're going to have the leaders of the future, if we're going to have uh, the type of uh, world that we want, we're going to have to think about how we deal with this aging workforce, because this is going to be the major issue. And it's, and it's a two-pronged issue. And this is the challenge back to the Y generation, because I think people will be working longer, not because, not only because they have to, some will have to, but because work in itself is often very rewarding. For those that can get rewarding work, it is very rewarding. And they want to stay in the workplace, and they have a lot to offer. And so how we deal with this, and how Gen Y deals with this, and how Gen Y begins to understand other generations as well, and what they can offer in terms of Sarah started with the way the world has changed, and I want to uh, just, the, the, the whole premise of this talk was to give 10 minutes of just put it out there, get everybody thinking so we can get a discussion going. So I want to finish with a video, and this video was done in end of uh, 2012, so some of the stuff in it's old now. Even one year, and some of the stuff is old. But I think it starts to... Well, I think it'll be a good catalyst for the discussion and the conversation that we're about to have uh, post this talk. <coughs>